You are listening to the Even Bigger Ideas podcast series, brought to you by State of Flux. Hi there, I'm Philip Eidson. I'm the host of the Procurious Even Bigger Ideas podcast, a five-part podcast series available exclusively to Big Ideas digital delegates. Sponsored by State of Flux, the series allows us to go that little bit deeper with five of the most intriguing power players at this year's Big Ideas Summit in London. And in this episode, I connected with Big Idea keynote speaker, James Bannerman. James is a best-selling author and creative change agent who combines creativity with psychology to help businesses innovate. And in today's conversation, James shares tips on how to release your inner creativity and facilitate innovation among your teams. And I start by asking James, what are some of the things that we can do as individuals to start to harness the creativity and the innovation that's really deep inside every one of us? Yes, well, thank you, Philip. Uh, there are many different uh, ways of approaching that uh, to release our sort of inner creativity or, or uh, innovative potential. I think one of the first things people uh, can benefit from is to stop labeling themselves. I come across a lot of people who don't think they're very creative, and it's almost like they wear it as a badge, I'm not creative. Right. And Dennis Waitley, who was um, the head of the Olympics team psychology um, section uh, for the American Olympic team many years ago, he used to say, it's not what we are that holds us back, but what we think we are not. So that tends to be a, a key start, actually getting back to, to that creativity for when we were kids rather than as we are now. Um, I think the second one is, is, weirdly enough, it's to stop trying so hard. It's a bit like trying to go to sleep. If you try to go to sleep, you're so busy focusing on it, you stay awake. And there's all kinds of brainwave activities going on there linked to beta waves and so on. So it's when we are in the zone, but we're not in the zone. It's when we're looking at a window, when we're reading something else, when we're watching a movie. Uh, that can help too. Um, but I think the third thing and I've written about this in a number of publications, is what de Bono used to call deliberate creativity. There are specific mind tools and techniques which we can use to be more creative, to generate new ideas, and to evaluate new ideas more effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's really just upskilling ourselves and, and learning from, from those uh, sort of psychological techniques which we can apply to any situation, whatever that might be. And you mentioned the fact that you know, about not thinking too hard about it, not trying to put too much pressure on yourself almost. Are there a couple of things that listeners can take away that maybe they can do to start getting themselves into that frame of mind or any kind of tricks or tips that you can recommend for them? It's, uh, I mean, there are, there are many. I think one of, the, one of the key things is people often sort of sit at their desk or sit at their laptop struggling to come up with ideas. And they've almost conditioned themselves to think that if they, if they go off and go for a walk or they go off uh, to do something completely different, it's their, their time wasting or, right. or they're, they're uh, not taking it seriously enough. But actually, a lot of evidence suggests that it's when we do that that we come up with our best ideas. So I'm not suggesting people just leave the office and don't come back to, to later. But I think there's a case of it's like trying to force a fruit to ripen. It doesn't always work very well. No, it's funny you mention that. You know, when I look at my own personal experience, all my creativity is really from when I'm out on a run. So as soon as you start surrounding yourself with a familiar environment and your desk and the things that I think are competing interests, you kind of focus on the here and now. But once you're able to disconnect yourself from that, it really opens up a whole kind of new wave of thinking. And there's so many times when I'm like running while tapping on my iPhone, all those ideas that are coming up with. And completely, and, and there is a whole psychology around that, and, and it's basically to do with what's called alpha and theta brainwaves. We tend to be most creative when we're focused, but we're not over-focused, and when we're relaxed, but we're not too relaxed. So it is when we're doing something like going, going for a run or, or, or going for a drive and looking out the window or flying on a plane. Um, we have to get into that zone, because if you say to yourself, I must come up with the best procurement idea ever right now, uh, the chances are people go into beta wave activity, sort of exam thinking, right. and uh, they get stressed and, and nothing comes to mind. So it's it's finding that optimum state w which allows creativity to flourish. So when we think about innovation, why is innovation? And I think by extension then, a CPO's need to broker that innovation. Why is it more important, do you think, now than it ever has been before? 
It's that's a very good question. It's um, one of the key views on this is that we live in an age of what's called accelerated evolution, that the pace of change has become ever faster. And I was writing about that recently um, for this particular project, actually saying that there's nothing new about innovation. If you look at the Edwardian times, uh, you know, within 10 years, they came up with the TV and they came up with the radio and they came up with the car and they came up with the plane. But what's happening now is that the pace of change is becoming so ridiculously fast, sometimes it's called sort of digital Darwinism, that we can get left behind very quickly. And, and someone called Shapiro in America, who, who defines innovation as staying relevant, I think is particularly uh, important because if we don't move with the times or, or step ahead of the times, we get left behind. And, and intriguingly, someone I know who's an innovation consultant called Paul Sloan, he says that at the end of the day, innovation will beat efficiency every time. You can carry on making more and more efficient gas lights and along comes electricity. You can carry on making more and more efficient uh, slide rules. But you know, it's, the world moves on. And, and that's why I think innovation now is, yeah, as, as many say, it's the only insurance against the relevant. Yeah, I feel like competitive advantage isn't driven by getting 2%, 3%, 5% smarter or cheaper are more effective. It's actually about the new things that you can take to market that actually blow away the competition because you have speed, you have the agility, you know, you're kind of taking a marketing leading position with something that's new. Completely. And and particularly in the modern world where sort of business model innovation mm -hmm. is becoming bigger than ever. You know, along comes an Uber or, or along comes an Airbnb and they completely break the rules of a whole industry. Um, so I think incremental is fine to a degree, um, but I think if people become complacent and assume that's all that's required, uh, very soon what they're doing becomes outdated. Right. And, and through your work, you know, you come into contact with a broad range of organizations, all of them, I think, seeking to foster some greater innovation among their teams. But when you first step in the door, what do you typically find? And, and the reason I ask that is because I want listeners to See that really there's no such thing as a lost cause or a lost hope, that everybody starts somewhere. <laughs> well, I, I, my philosophy is, is that there is no lost cause when it comes to creativity. And, and literally over the years, I've, I've worked for everyone. You know, for, well, I, well, I feel I have, you know, from the Aston Martins <laughs> right. and Rolls Royces and to space agencies. And it, it doesn't matter if people are, are nuclear physicists or, or accountants or, the, or they work in the world of you know, marketing or whatever. It doesn't matter what the, the function is. It doesn't really matter what the sector is. The point is that, that creativity can manifest itself in many different ways mm -hmm. in a business context. And it could be improving processes and systems. It could be uh, tweaking structures. So it doesn't always have to be the, the most glamorous new iPhone it's, it's applying um, an alternative way of thinking to many of the day-to-day -day problems that we face. So, so yeah, for, I, I genuinely don't believe, well, I haven't yet come across a completely lost cause. And, I, and actually, where there's a paradox here is some of the best ideas I've ever come across when I've been facilitating sessions have come from the people that I would least expect them, uh, expect it to come from. It, it's not always, you know, the TV companies and the advertising agencies who are the most innovative and creative in terms of uh, coming up with something fresh and different, because often they're just regurgitating what they've done before. It's, it's organizations where you think, wow, you know, it, again, it goes back to that labeling that mm -hmm. They might not see themselves as creative, but but the creative is definitely creativity is definitely embedded in there. Why do you think it's that you find that? Because is it that it's almost that they're not surrounded by creativity? So now they're given the option to kind of think that way that brings out things that they never knew existed, or is it something that's just a little bit more situational? It's uh, it's a big subject. I, w I won't bore you with my, my PhD <laughs> research on it, but it, but it's it's linked to a whole range of concepts of what's called sort of organisational learned helplessness and self-efficacy and things. I think at the end of the day, it, it's not that we. Um, I think we we forget how to be creative. Mm -hmm. We we school it out of ourselves, and it, it's the double whammy of of fear of criticism and and uh, sort of need for conformity. You know, as as very young children we see the world in a very different way uh, in terms of possibility thinking, anything's possible. Uh, but as we get older, we, we, 
our minds become so full of you can't do this and you can't do that and that won't work and that's been done before that a lot of that sort of innate creativity gets squashed and stifled. Um, so it's really just about re-educating ourselves and, and unlearning some of those uh, sort of negative thoughts. So when you think about harnessing this from an organizational perspective, you know, I look at most corporate structures and think that they're built to really drive a process, you know, to help bring scale versus encouraging creativity. Is it possible to build a culture that facilitates creativity broadly? Or is it more effective to identify, you know, maybe who the innovators are within your team and then allow them to operate almost using different rules? That's a very good question, Phil. I mean, to be honest... Every organization's different, mm-hmm. and, and what will work brilliantly well for one will, will completely backfire uh, for another. Um, all I, I would say is that my, again, my guiding philosophy is that we live in an age now when it, corporate-wide creativity is becoming more and more important, that in the days of silos, uh, literally, I, I remember picking up a, a business dictionary, I think it was from the 80s, and if you look up the word creativity or you look up the word innovation, it, it doesn't define it. It just says see new product development. Right. Uh, because in those days, you know, it's, that's where the creativity happened. And I think now it, you can apply it in so many different ways. I mean, any part of a business that needs to improve itself or solve problems or imagine where that department wants to be in two, five years time, that all involves creative thinking and lateral thinking. So, so I, would, I would suggest that obviously there are parts where people are slightly hamstrung by uh, sort of legislation and, and regulations and so on. So, so in no ways is it a good idea to compromise you know, so many things, right. but it's just having that, that flexibility and wriggle room to, to approach the same issues from an alternative perspective to see if there's a better way or a, or a different way of doing mm-hmm. things. And so as we start to wrap up, I'd love to bring some kind of takeaways that listeners can go on and actually act on today. And so I wondered if you could just share some tips on how a CPO or how a procurement leader can really start to release that creative genius that's within their team to help them start push forward their big ideas and bring them into reality. I think there are, I mean, there are many different ways that can happen. And in the talk in London later this month, uh, we'll go into that in more detail on, on what I call the five main techniques for generating ideas, the can-do model, uh, which I write about in my book, Genius. But I think in, in terms of what can CPOs do differently, I think sometimes it can help to sort of step back and, and realize that actually um, procurement, supply chain management – has a history of innovation, you know, mm-hmm. going back to the days of the pyramids. Uh, in fact, I was reading quite recently, um, into, is it Keith Oliver, who actually came up with the term supply chain management uh, back in the 80s. Um, originally, he was calling it something completely different. He was calling it integrated inventory management to a Dutch client. He didn't know what the hell he was talking about. <laughs> and it was only when he explained it that apparently the, the Dutch client said, oh, so what you mean is this? And he said, that's right. Right. You know, a total chain, the total chain from the point of origin to the point of consumption. But the point there being that sometimes it's having that flexibility to go, you know what? Yeah, I called it this before, but I think you're right. I think that could be a better name. And it's having that, um, it's encouraging people to have that sort of permission to be creative. There has to be some sort of wriggle room uh, in a team dynamic because if people are too afraid of getting things wrong, or if they continually feel that everything has to be uh, 100% perfect straight away, then all that happens is people go into to, to a practical mindset, which means do what works, do what you've done before. And, and it's repeating old patterns rather than contemplating new patterns. So I, I think it's one of those things. I mean, CPOs obviously have to, have to function and excel in, in a certain context. And, and in no way would I dare to recommend that they move away from what works i think it's just a case of other things that could be done slightly better and uh, if they have that expansive mindset then, then all things become possible well james i have to wrap up now but i just want to thank you so much for joining me today on the precarious big idea podcast it's been a joy and very much appreciated brilliant well thank you philip and thank you very much for for inviting me along Thanks for listening to this Even Bigger Ideas podcast, sponsored by State of Flux. 
If you have any questions for James, simply tweet at Procurious underscore using the hashtag BigIdeas2017 or share your questions and comments in the Big Ideas Digital Delegates group.